The Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast, with your host, Rich Decker. Hello, and thank you for taking some of your valuable time to listen to the show. My guest for this episode is Christine Ayala, who is Senior Product Development Manager at Colby Corp., She is also a highly trained musician, a speaker, and author of the book One Spirit, One Church. She's currently working on her second book, which will be out in time for the Christmas season. Christine has been involved in some level of Christian ministry since she was a teenager, and she has played many roles in the ministry. In addition to her work at Colby Corp., she is devoting herself to spreading the message of overcoming division and achieving oneness in the church through her speaking coaching, and writing. Christine is also a person who experienced what one could only call a miracle cure from a lifelong ailment. She and others might call it a faith healing, but no matter what your beliefs are, what happened to Christine, current science has no explanation. I must admit to you, I am someone who you might call a non-believer. I prefer to say if asked about my religion or beliefs, that I'm from the school of I don't know. Even though I'm from the school of I don't know, I cannot deny the incredible miracle that happened in Christine's life. This is the hero's journey of Christine Ayala. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you for joining us today on the Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast. I'm very excited to know your story in more detail. I know a little bit about your story and your background, but I don't know the whole story and I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. So let's start at the beginning. Tell us about your childhood growing up in Kent, Washington. And I ask every guest on the show this question. What was one principle, for better or worse, sometimes it's not always for the best, your parents instilled in you that you still carry with you today? Well, first, thank you, Rich, for taking the time to speak with me. I'm excited to share my story and to be on your podcast. It's an honor. So growing up in Kent, Washington, I I moved to Kent actually when I was 10, spent my early childhood in rural southern Idaho with a very simple lifestyle, and it was a great way to, to grow up. There wasn't a city. There weren't any of the city problems. I was completely unaware of that. In fact, never even saw a McDonald's until I was 10. That was pretty cool. But then we moved to Washington and I experienced the city and diversity and it was fascinating to me. I really enjoy it there. The only thing I didn't like about living there was a lot of rain, but I bet everybody says that. As far as a principle that I grew up with, that my parents instilled in me, that I carry to today, there's quite a number of them. But the gist of it is that we love each other no matter what. And we're always there for one another, no matter what. Even if we messed up, we're always there to help each other pick up the pieces and move on. My parents are have a very strong faith and they instilled that into us and they instilled into us that that God is always good even when bad things happen. My parents have also been married for 54 years now and they modeled this fantastic dedication to the relationship and to family to all of us and the good times and the bad and yes there were bad times and sickness and health. And there have been a lot of health issues that they've had to face with, with me and with one of my siblings and now my dad. So they have absolutely instilled in me to be a hundred percent there for each other. You have a very close family, I'm assuming. I do. We're very close. How's that helped shape your life? It's meant everything to me. Because no matter what, I always knew that they were going to be there for me. And when things got really hard, 
I was always able to lean on them. And when they've had hard things, they've always been able to lean on me and vice versa. We always are there for each other, whether it's for emotional support or physical strength or just to make things happen or to help a dream come true. We support each other that way and really work together to help make each other happy and feel that unconditional love. I've never talked to anyone that has never been to a McDonald's until they were 10. That's an amazing part of that first part of your story. It's, it's true. In the town I grew up in, we had a Kentucky Fried Chicken, an a and root beer, and an Arctic Circle drive-in. That was the fast food. That was it. Well, at least back then, it was real food. Uh, as opposed to now where I don't know what's in it, but I, just, I mean, I've just never, you know, I mean, growing up, everybody sees McDonald's, you know, even small town, big town, but you know, it's interesting. <laughs> you, you know, what's funny is I, I, I could sing the jingle because we saw the commercials on TV, but we never had them. Oh, you never did. Did you always want to go to McDonald's? Oh yes. That was like ex- super, super special. What did you want to be when you grew up? We, some of us want to be, you know, the fireman, the, the musician, whatever. What did you want to be? Until I was a teenager, I wanted to be a doctor. I really wanted to help people and to help people be well. I was fascinated by medicine and just all of the scientific stuff that I completely did not understand at that time. But I thought it was cool. Now, what happened when you became a teenager? What changed? I had a lot of medical problems. Being a patient, spending a lot of time in hospitals and having doctors who looked so anguished tell me that they couldn't help me changed my mind. How so? I saw the pain in their face when they couldn't solve my problems or help me or make me better. And it was this complete helplessness. They didn't have faith. And I'm sure that there are doctors who had faith. Maybe one of my doctors had faith, but they didn't show it to me. And it was just hard to see that. And I also discovered that I really hate hospitals. It would be hard to be a doctor. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it sure would. Well, I guess you could be a, a family doctor. What started happening for you? What were the health problems you were experiencing? When I was 11 and I started going through puberty, one of my hips started to grow wrong. And it ended up that my my leg, my f- leg bone, my femur fused up into my pelvis and I couldn't walk and I couldn't use it. And it was very, very painful. So I spent a lot of time on crutches and this was a long time ago. So there was no Americans with Disabilities Act. There was no accessibility things going on. So I used crutches to get around and that in itself is challenging if you've ever had to use crutches like for a sprained ankle or something like that for a couple of weeks, it's, it's really challenging, but to use it, the crutches every day for years, you can only imagine how challenging that might be. As I was going through, this was in the sixth, seventh grade after seeing several doctors and orthopedic surgeons and going to specialists We found a specialist who thought he could help and figured out a way to help. And indeed, he did. And I had major surgery when I was 12, where they actually cut apart my hip joint and rebuilt it with bone grafts and screws and stuff. And I spent two months in a body cast. And after that, of course, another several months on crutches, non-weight bearing, and trying to get stronger. I was very weak at that time after the surgery and being in bed for months. And I started to recover. And I'm a 
I'm a kind of a go-getter. Actually, I am a real go-getter, not kind of. And holding me back is, is not something that pretty much anybody can do. So I, I pushed on and I started to walk again. And I was only allowed to walk, wasn't allowed to run or dance or exercise or jump or do any of the fun things that any of my peers were doing. I could go to a basketball game and I could watch. I could go to a volleyball game and I could watch. I couldn't participate in anything. And I started to get better. And after a short time, the pain really came back. Not that it was ever completely gone, but it came back in force. And I started to have trouble walking again and was back on crutches. And they discovered that the bone grafts had actually started to grow and the problem was starting to repeat itself, which was crazy. The doctors were a little blown away that that was even possible. And so I had surgery again. I was on crutches for months again, and I went through that. And in that surgery, I ended up with nerve damage in my leg. And as they tried to treat the nerve damage, it got worse. And the nerve damage was crippling. And very, very painful. So painful that at one point, I actually asked the doctors to cut my leg off. Because it hurts so bad. And I found myself. At 15 years old, 16 years old, going to the pain clinic for shots in my back. My parents helped me tr- find and try every treatment we could that was short of lots of drugs. I had at my disposal, I could, I could get drugs anytime I wanted to, prescription drugs for the pain, but I chose not to. I I hated them. I pretty much endured the pain. And it was the kind of pain that made it so that I couldn't focus or sleep. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never went away, but it did get worse. Sometimes it was better. It, It ranged from about six to 10 on the pain scale, if you will. 10 being the the worst pain you could possibly imagine. And that's how I lived my life. That was my teenage years. I still went to school. I missed a lot of school because I was going to the hospital and going to doctors and they were trying this and they tried that and they would put me in body casts to see if that would help. And it was, it was hard. By the time I was 17, I was using the first version of a TENS unit. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a, it's a, a little electrical stimulator. We, you put electrodes on. They use them in a lot now in chiropractor's offices. But you put, you put the electrodes on in certain places and it sends out little pulses of electricity and it feels really good. And that actually helped. It gave me uh, a, enough relief that I was functioning and I was able to sleep better at night. I still had to use crutches when I was needing to walk. But I was functioning. And through that, I graduated from high school with honors and got a scholarship. I played, I was a, I am a pianist and I played the piano a lot, which worked really well since you can sit down to do that. And I went away to college and I moved to California and went to a great music school and was there. And during my freshman year, the TENS unit stopped helping. And I woke up one day in intense, excruciating pain and unable to to hardly move, actually. And so I went to the pain clinic in San Francisco and saw a new doctor who was arrogant and difficult to deal with. 
and made me get more shots in my spine. And those shots, by the way, are really, really painful. I think I've had over 20 spinal nerve blocks and they're, they're horrible. And they didn't help. But at the University of California, there was a neurosurgeon who had been pioneering a new technique for chronic pain that involved a, an implant in the spinal cord. By this time, I'm 19 years old, and I wanted to live. I wanted to experience life. I wanted to do things. I did not see myself as being able to function crippled for the rest of my life. And so I, I did some serious wheeling and dealing to get in to see this neurosurgeon. It wasn't easy. And I got my insurance to pay for it. And when I came in, he was hilarious because he's like, this, this young girl is, is, is crutch, walking on crutches into his office. And all of his patients were in their 40s and 50s. And, and he just kind of did a, a double take and he's like, who are you? What are you? And I'm like, you've got my chart. And he told me that he couldn't do this surgery on me because I was too young and the risks were too great. And, you know, you needed to be pretty desperate to be able to basically qualify to be in, to have this surgery because it was still a very, very new technique. And the risks were great because they implanted in your spinal cord. I, I, was, I was fine with that because being paralyzed couldn't be much worse than being in intense pain was the way I looked at it. I was already crippled. He said, okay. And three weeks later, I got my first spinal implant. And it was a very, very hard surgery and takes a long time to recover from, but it worked. It brought my pain under control so that it was like a three to five most of the time, which for me was, you know, the angels were singing and, and, and there were rainbows and puppies everywhere for, for that. It was fantastic. And I could walk. Didn't need to use crutches anymore. I, of course, had a bit of a limp, but it was okay. And I, I started to live my life like that. When you woke up, was the pain like almost immediately gone? Not exactly, because when I woke up, it, it, it's a long surgery. It's like a six-hour surgery under anesthesia. And so when I woke up, I was pretty pretty doped up and messed up. And within the first couple of hours, they were in there programming the, the machine and I'm still really doped up. And I was on morphine and everything too, because the surgery itself is four incisions. And so I had all of that going on as well. But I did get immediate pain relief when they turned the machine on. And I could, I could, feel it and I could articulate it. And it got better as, as I recovered. I was in the hospital for a week from that surgery. And as I recovered, they, uh, it was, it was marvelous. Well, before you continue your, your, your story, I want to ask you a couple of questions, something I'm, I'm curious about. Sure. Looking back now, what do you think the effects of losing your childhood were for you. Did you feel like, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it because you basically, from the time this started until it ended, you, you, I mean, you didn't have any childhood, not necessarily, or am I wrong? Well, it was my teenage years. So the high school experience was definitely different for me. However, I was a musician and so I was, a, I guess, a music geek, if you will. And so I had friends that were also music geeks and I was able to hang out with them and I didn't have quite the social life everybody else had, but 
I, I fought for my life. I, I fought, I, w- I, I knew I wasn't normal and I, but I wasn't mentally a problem. And because of my chutzpah, if you will, I, I did my best to participate in as, as much as I could. And my parents enabled that as much as they could. They, they wanted me to have as much of normalcy as possible. And it was really pretty effective. I kind of buried myself in piano. I, I practiced a lot. And I, the last two years of high school was taking my piano lessons at the University of Washington from a prof- professor there. And it was it was a great way for me to focus and focus on something that I could do and that I could do well. So did music keep your head above water? It totally did. Absolutely. That was my other question is, is, you know, how did you not sink into such a deep depression? Oh, I had times. I had some very dark times. Uh, the first time that I had a neurologist tell me that I wasn't really in pain that it was all in my head and that I needed to, to snap out of it kind of attitude was so horrible. And she made me have this test called an EMG, electromyogram, which is not a painful test for normal people. And she says, this will prove that you know, it's, it's all in your head because I was just arguing with her. I was 15 and, you know, she just had no respect for me as a person. I had that test and the test itself was so painful that I was literally screaming and crying by the end of it. I I missed a couple of days of school just because I was traumatized from this. And after that and, and after my, all of my other doctors, told me there's nothing that we can do. This is permanent, irreversible nerve damage. And there's absolutely nothing that anybody can do. We can just try to teach you to manage the pain. They even offered the methadone program to me when I was 16. Did the doctor, after you were crying and screaming, did she believe that the pain was real? You want to hear the worst thing about that is she never saw me again. She wouldn't even... She wouldn't even give me the results of the test. I had to get them from one of my other doctors. I would suspect that she was embarrassed. I would suspect so. I actually filed an official complaint against her at 15. <laughs> 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 because that's, I was, so, I was very angry. But after that, I did sink into a real depression. And that's when I had asked the doctor to cut off my leg. It was my mom's strength and her belief in me that kept me from drowning in it. it saved me, really, and during that, that period of time. But after that, I just made a decision. I really did. I chose life. I had before me life and death because to, to go down that path of depression and to go ahead and take the drugs and the methadone program that they were offering, to me, that was choosing death because I saw the people in the waiting room who were on that program and they were not living. So was it a method to manage your pain, the methadone? It would have been. I never did that. So people no. were actually doing that. That was part of their treatment. Yeah, that, it's, it was all about pain management. I would suspect that most of those people are probably not alive. I couldn't imagine that any of them would be. They were all significantly older than me. Remember, I was the young kid in the pain clinic surrounded by people that were at least 20, 30 years older than me. I don't know for sure, but from what I understand that methadone is a highly addictive drug that basically you're in trouble <laughs> if you have to take that all the time. Yeah, it's an opiate. It's it, it's plain and simple, but there aren't other pain drugs that will work on nerve pain. You have to use opiates. And yeah, that's that's really all there is to it. 
So let's go back to the, you had the spinal implant and you started getting some pain relief. Let's go uh, take it from there again. Certainly. So the great thing about it was I started to live a normal life and I was going to school and I was dating and I was just having fun. It was great. It was kind of what I didn't get to do when I was in high school, if you will. I had the little downside that I had to have surgery once a year to change the battery in my implant. Of course, have that six-week recovery. So I spent six weeks of every year dealing with that. But for me, it was worth it because it gave me life, gave me the ability to, to walk and to be normal. Again, I was only able to walk. I was not allowed to dance or run or exercise or, or you know, do anything like that. But I, kind, I did dance. I just didn't tell the doctors. Then I moved to Texas to study piano under a great concert pianist there and finished my, my college degree, still every year having surgery. Graduated from the University of Texas in San Antonio, met my husband and got married, moved back to Washington, still having surgery every year. And I decided to have a baby. Of course, the company that made the implant and all of my doctors said, no, no, don't do that. But I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I did. I was, there were a few complications at the end, but I had a healthy baby. About that time, and this was in the 90s, they had improved the battery technology to the place where they lasted two to three years. I was thrilled because now I only had to have surgery every two or three years. The thing was, is it was hard to gauge exactly when the battery would start to die to schedule that surgery. And as soon as the battery started to die, I was back on crutches because the problem wasn't solved. It was just controlled by electricity. Then I had another baby and I was doing still the same thing functioning with the implant and, and happy to do so. I was, I was living a good life, enjoyed being a mom. And then, well, and throughout this whole time, I should say that I was in ministry. I was a, a worship leader, taught piano and, and really loved it. And then in 2001, we changed churches and I stopped doing full-time ministry so that I could spend more time with my kids. At this new church, I attended a prayer meeting. Everything changed. When the pastor prayed for me, he prayed for all of the nerves to work properly in my body. And he prayed for complete and total healing for me which was great. I thought that's, that's a wonderful prayer. Thank you very much. I went home and went to bed, not thinking anything of it. At four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and there was something very weird going on. I felt like I was on like a vibration table or something. And there was an earthquake or something. And I looked around and the, the room wasn't shaking and my husband was asleep. And, but I felt like my whole body was shaking and vibrating, not in an alarming way. It, it, it actually felt good, kind of like a massage. It was just weird. And, and then I fell back asleep and I woke up and I went about my day. The next day, the same thing happened. Four o'clock in the morning. And this I was I was kind of shocked because I thought maybe I had dreamt that it had happened and it wasn't real. But it happened again at four o'clock in the morning. Wow, this is this is really bizarre. Then it happened again the next day. And this went on for a couple of weeks. I didn't really understand it or know what was going on. I just knew that it 
felt good, that I felt great. It was amazing. But I didn't tell anybody about it because I figured they would all think that I was crazy. Of course, I couldn't prove it to anybody. So I just kept it to myself. And then I was sitting at church and I happened to talk to my pastor who had prayed for me that, that night. And I told him what had been happening. And he, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Christine, don't you see you're being visited by the Holy Spirit? You should listen. And as soon as he said that, I knew it was true. And my mind was kind of blown. So the next morning, when it happened again at exactly four o'clock in the morning. I don't know what the significance of that was. Still to this day, I don't know. But at four o'clock in the morning, that experience started again. And I, I started to pray. I was like, okay, so God, is this you? And he said, yes, I want you to turn your machine off. Let me just tell you, I had a remote control for this stimulator that was implanted in my spinal cord, and I could turn it on and off, and I could adjust it. I could, I could make it stronger if I was having a bad day, if the pain was worse, or I could turn it back down if I was doing all right. So it was adjustable. And I, I told God, well, no, I'm not going to turn it off. That's, that's stupid. <laughs> And, and I don't recommend that you tell God that what he asks you to do is stupid. I just want to make that plain to everybody. But I did. And then I said, amen. And I ended the prayer and I went to sleep. And the next day at four o'clock in the morning, it came back again. I started to pray again and, and thank God for being there and being so faithful, I, you know, I, Hey, you know, God, what, what's going on? What do you want from me? Well, here I am. And he said, I want you to turn the machine off. And I was like, no, that's, that's just not a good idea. I don't think that I'm going to do that. Amen. Because how do you end a conversation with God? You say, amen. I didn't know what else to say. It was May in Seattle, Washington area. And that day was a beautiful, beautiful day. I got up and I decided to do what I shouldn't do and do a whole bunch of yard work because it had been raining for months and my yard was a mess. So I went outside and I did a solid six or seven hours of really hard yard work. I edged, I pulled weeds, I trimmed bushes, I did everything. Usually when, when I would do something like that, I would pay for it for at least a week with a lot of pain because I'm not supposed to do that kind of work. But I just figure, you know, I'll turn up the, the level on my, my implant and I'll just suffer through it because I just wanted to get it, the yard work done. So the next morning at four o'clock, the Holy Spirit visits me. He said that he wanted me to turn the implant off. And as I was getting ready to say no again, he said, wait a minute. And he used that tone of voice. Wait a minute. And I was like, what? And I did use that tone of voice also. I was very insolent. And he said, haven't you noticed anything? And I'm like, I, what? What would I have noticed? I don't know what you're talking about. The Lord said to me, shouldn't you be in a lot of pain right now? And it dawned on me. Yeah, I, I should be in a lot of pain right now, actually. And I'm not. And so I started to stretch and I, I started to move around and I got out of bed and I was I was like, wow, I'm not in any pain at all. And he said, I want you to turn the implant off. 
And I said, I'll think about it. I did not go back to sleep. I got up and I went downstairs and I started to stretch and move around and do things. And I pushed my body like crazy to its limits that day. I, I didn't tell anybody what was going on. I just did it. And I was pretty amazed because a lot of things that I couldn't do before, I could do. Just the, the idea of sitting on the floor and stretching was very painful, even with the implant. And yet I was stretching and I was moving around and I had range of motion in my legs and my back that I hadn't had since I was 10. And I was pretty blown away. And so the next morning at four o'clock in the morning, when the Holy Spirit visited me and said, I want you to turn the machine off. I said, okay, I'm going to turn it off, but let's make a deal. I'm going to turn it off, but you're not going to let it hurt. This is, this is like a done deal, right? It's not going to hurt. And he didn't answer, but I did. I went and I got the remote control and I turned it off. And then I was waiting and I was just waiting for the pain to come back. I almost expected it to come back because that had been my experience for decades already. I'd had the implant. It didn't come back. Day goes by and another day goes by and another day goes by. And after a few, I think three days, I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is amazing. And so I actually told people. Until then, all of this was private. I hadn't told anybody because I didn't want them to think I was off my rocker. So I told my pastor and my husband and my family, look, I turned the implant off three days ago. This is what's been happening for the last three weeks. I think God healed me. My pastor was like, well, yeah, God healed you. And I was like, this is a miracle. This is amazing. He's like, yeah, it is. And so I started to, to testify about it, talk about it and had gone. I went to the chiropractor because I was always afraid to go to a chiropractor. And but I wanted x-rays and that was the cheapest place to get them. <clears throat> so I went and got x-rays and sure enough, the arthritis and all of the stuff in the joints, it was all gone was all gone. It was really, really a miracle. It was a bona fide miracle from God. As we were going through it all, I thought, wow, I don't know why God picked me to do this. I, I didn't even ask. It was pretty amazing. I was content with my implant. A couple weeks later, a group from my church was going to a, a crusade. And it was one of these faith healing crusades, which I didn't have any experience with. I thought it was a, a little woohoo. But I was going, I was chaperoning these kids. And I was like, okay, well, God healed me. So I'll go to the faith healer crusade. We went to the crusade. And it was really amazing. The, the presence of God was very evident and people's lives were being changed and people were being healed. And, and it was an amazing experience to, to witness. And I was just rejoicing and, and praying for everybody. And the next morning we went to the second day of the crusade and we walked in and we actually had great seats really close to the stage and the, the, the music was fantastic. So we went in and when we sat down and when I sat down in the chair there in the Tacoma Dome, I felt as if my body had been pierced by a huge sword. And the pain came back in such a measure that it 
literally knocked the wind out of me. And once I had recovered my breath, I mean, it literally knocked the wind out of me. I was sitting in my chair with my head bowed, freaking out inside, completely freaking out because I was terrified and I was in an incredible amount of pain. And as I sat there, I started to curse God. I cursed him out. I said terrible things. I said he was a bad God. I told him that he was cruel to make me think that I was healed and then to let this happen. And I, I was totally feeling sorry for myself and 100% pity party. And the whole time I was there, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure this went on for more than 30 minutes. Everybody thought I was just praying, but I wasn't praying. I was angry and I was desperate and I was scared and I was hurting. And the service started and the music was going on and I was still in my own horrible little pity party. Not that I didn't have a reason to be angry because after all, I was in a great deal of pain. And then I kind of took a breath and I, I hushed for a minute. And I lifted my head and I looked around and there was an altar call going, along, going on and people were all over the stadium getting saved giving their lives to, to Christ and everybody was praying and worshiping. And I told God, I said, you know, God, you're going to look so bad when I walked in here and I won't be able to walk out. Because I knew at that time there was no way that I could take three steps. And then I said, but but listen, God, here I am, still full of lots of chutzpah. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to stand up and you heal me. And this time for real and for good and everything will be okay. And so I stood up and I was crying. It hurt so bad to stand. But I stood up holding onto the chair in front of me. And less than five minutes later, the faith healer called out my healing from the stage. And at that moment, I felt that same feeling that I'd felt at four o'clock in the morning every day. And the pain was gone. And I've been healed ever since. And that was in 2001. And at first, I didn't understand why it had to happen that way. But then as I, I talked to my pastors and I, and I read the Bible, which is I, I did immediately because I couldn't understand why this had happened. Every instance of healing that takes place in the Bible it, it says, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you whole. And when my pastor prayed for me three weeks before then, I hadn't, I hadn't asked to be healed. I hadn't had any faith for it. God did all of that just to get me to turn the implant off so that he could really heal me. But he needed me to say, I believe you can. And I believe you will. And when I did that, he healed me. And I don't know why he chose me to heal me. Except that I will tell the story every chance I get to anybody that I can. Because there are so many people who pray for healing and don't get it. I don't, I can't explain that. All I know is that God healed me with an absolute incredible miracle. And I don't have 
any physical limitations now. I can run. I can dance. I can hike. I go to the gym three times a week. I lift weights. I'm stronger and more active now at 52 than I've ever been in my life. Have you ever gone back to any of the doctors that treated you throughout the years? And if you did, what do they have to say about what happened? I haven't gone back to the same doctors because it's actually really hard to get in to see them. And uh, most of them were retired or had, like the, the doctor who I initially saw was retired. But the other doctors that I've seen and they've run tests have have agreed it's a miracle, but some, they don't like that. They don't like things being a miracle and not explainable by, by medical science. And to be honest with you, I don't usually go back to those doctors because I don't want a doctor trying to tell me that I'm still sick or that something's still wrong with me. And it's all in my head because they're crazy. Yeah, they were, they were amazed and they, they believe in miracles. There's a lot of doctors and they've seen other miracles and they, there's no denying that I had arthritis. I have our, I have the x-rays from when I was 25 and 30 years old that show arthritis throughout my, my hips and pelvis and back. And then I have uh, the the x-rays from after that that show there's no arthritis in my hips and and back. And arthritis does not go away. It only gets worse. And you can't see nerve damage and nerve repair, but you can test it. And when you test my my reflexes and, and the nerves in my legs, they all work. They didn't work before. In fact, in my left leg, I didn't have any reflexes. Now, what do you say to people who are non-believers? Most of the time, even the people who don't believe it are pretty dumbfounded. They don't have much to say. Even the doctors who don't believe me, they can't tell me why. They can check my reflexes. They can check the x-rays. They can't deny that I'm better. They don't believe in God. And they don't believe in miracles. And so they kind of choose to dismiss it. People who are encounter stuff that they can't explain and they need to explain everything tend to just ignore those things. But for the most part, when people hear the story, because the Holy Spirit is on, on the story, it gives people faith and it gives people hope. And that's why I tell the story, because... I didn't really do anything except for stand up and believe. God did it. I don't I don't take any credit for it, but I try to live my life in a way that is worthy of of this and and I'm excited to be able to live long and prosper as Spock would say. Why do you think it happened? Why I mean is it was it because you believed that he, what he said with the, the prayer or why do you think it happened? Do you think you're just chosen? I think I was chosen. Well, what is this that we are experiencing now? What is this world to you? The world that we are experiencing now isn't terribly different than the world that Jesus Christ experienced 2000 years ago. We think it is, but really it isn't. Uh, sin was rampant. When I visited Israel, I saw the Canaanite altars where they had brothels and sex was glorified and they did child sacrifices and they had human trafficking was legal. The world was actually a lot worse then than it is now as far as those kinds of things go. There were horrible wars. Quality of life was terrible. So where we live now, we live in a world where there's actually a great deal of prosperity and our, our prosperity has made us a little numb to how much we really need God, I think, and how much we really need each other. I, I see in our society, in the, in, in America, we 
we use things and prosperity and wealth to substitute for things that I believe are more important, which is love and compassion and companionship and fellowship with other people, which is how God wants us to live. And yes, there's a lot of ugliness in our world today. And that's where we find ourselves. It's not permanent because God is going to change everything. And in as I believe, and as I've been very vocal about, I believe in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is going to come back and and redeem the, the, the world and the church. You know what I, what I think about, and I, I forget this too. I stopped watching the news a while ago. I don't watch any news. Most of the time, I, I don't know what's going on. But for me, it's like what you said. It's the same news of, of 2000 years ago. It's the same news, but we are living as, as far as humans, homo sapiens, we're living in the greatest time in our history. There's, there's uh, basically famine has disappeared. Mass diseases have been pretty much under control. Those were the two main things that killed people and wars. Now, granted, there's still a lot of wars going on, but compared to the, our past history, we're, we're living in the greatest time. Now, if you're another species on the planet or the planet itself, look out <laughs> because things aren't going too well. But for humans, it's going very well. Yeah, there's truth in that. There's definitely truth in that. If you could go back and talk to your younger self, knowing what was coming, what would you say to yourself? It's all going to be worth it. And what's the greatest lesson? Not, not just the miracle, but the pain as well. What, what's some of the great lessons you've taken away from your experience? I think the biggest lesson that I learned is to never give up. I have a life verse, if you will, from the Bible that I clung to through my teenage years and I still cling to. And it's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because if I had to do it on my own strength and by myself, I could not have done it. But because I had that faith and I had a great family to lean on, I could do it. And I never gave up. And God never gave up on me. What would you say your purpose now is? What's your mission for whatever time remains in your life? My purpose and my mission in life is, is to let people know how important it is for us to get along and to treat each other with love and compassion. Loving people is the greatest message of Jesus Christ. And that's why he came and he loved everybody. That's what he wants from us. And that's what I want. I, I'm very passionate about helping people help each other, especially in the church and not, not a denomination, not a building, the big C church, the whole church, the worldwide Christian church. Everybody seems to be so focused on what we don't have in common or what's different between the Baptists and the, the Lutherans, etc. They're so focused on what makes them different and how their church is better than that church down the street and our baptism is better than that baptism. And the truth of the matter is, is they talked about that in the Bible and they said it really doesn't matter. Jesus' message was that we would all be unified in doing the work of the ministry, which is feeding the hungry, helping the disenfranchised, and loving the unlovable. The beauty in this is that God did create us with all of this wonderful, fantastic diversity. I don't think for one second that he ever wanted us to follow all the same worship patterns and all do everything the same in the same kind of church. Because one thing that I've noticed is that in creation and everything that God did, there's no cookie cutters, not one single thing that is alive. 
is a replica. Everything is unique. And that's how God made us. And so if he made us unique like that, then all of the different churches and the denominations are unique for his purpose. And we need to embrace that, that they are able to have that relationship of, with God to lean on the same way that I did. So my passion and my mission is to, to tell the world about that and to hopefully foster community and foster unity in, in the church. You've written a book. Was your book about your story? My story is in the book, but it's actually only a small part of one chapter. The book itself is called One Spirit, One Church. And that's what it's about. It's about being unified in what makes us the same. All the other stuff, it just doesn't matter. I feel confident in making that statement that none of that other stuff is important to God. He wants us to get along and to work together. Because as you were talking about, famine is is almost eradicated and diseases can be controlled. But the fact of the matter is, is there's entire parts of this world where famine is still happening. And we have the ability to solve that problem. But people are so selfish and so self-centered that they don't do it. It breaks my heart because it doesn't have to be that way. And there's entire parts of the world where there's still genocide going on. Lord have mercy. All of these things could be solved if the church actually got along with each other and used all of that energy that they they spend arguing with each other and they used it to help helping other people. So you're writing another book, is that correct? I am. In fact, I just finished the first draft. I'm very excited about it. Can you give us a little clue on what this book will be about? I can. This book is definitely based on my personal experience even more. It's about what it means to be whole and what it means to be healed. In the Bible, when Jesus healed people, he said, your faith has made you whole or shalom. The Aramaic word that he used was shalom. And that word doesn't mean peace as everybody thinks. Oh, shalom, peace be with you. That's not what it means. It means complete and whole. Nothing's missing and nothing is broken. And if you try to wrap your mind about what that means, what does it, what would life be like if there was nothing missing and nothing broken, if you were whole? And, and what did Jesus mean by you're whole now? And so the book is about what does it mean to be whole how can you be whole? Well, for those that, that hear this and, and uh, are, are non-believers, what would be your final word for them? And I must confess, I, I am one of them. I was raised Catholic, but I don't necessarily believe all that. But your story is undeniable. I mean, it's undeniable. What would you say to us? I would say search. Because if you search for God, you'll find him. A lot of people don't believe, but they're also afraid to search. And then when they, they search, they don't want it to be God. That's the answer. They want it to be something that they can wrap their cognitive mind around. The fact of creation itself, I feel like it shows that God is undeniable because even if, even if the world was created by the Big Bang Theory, the only way that that would work according to most scientists, not all, but most scientists, is if there was an intelligent being behind it. Because it broke all of the laws of physics. And so if the laws of physics are truly laws of physics, then it couldn't have happened like that. But God himself can break the laws of physics because he made the laws. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for sharing your story. 
where can people find more about you? I'll have some links in the show notes, but if, if somebody wants to just go on and while they're listening, where would they go? The best place to go is my website. It's christineayala.com. Can you spell that? Certainly. It's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-A-Y-A-L-A.com. You'll find a little bit more about me, uh, my bio, a little bit about my book and how you can purchase it. I'm also going to be launching some other things on that website. I've got some video blogs that I'm going to be putting up there and some other information and some probably some teasers from my next book. Thank you for sharing your hero's journey. It's a truly a hero's journey. And it's an amazing story. Again, you know, it brings into question, you know, the cognitive dissonance for me is uh, full, fully on right now. <laughs> I <bet. laughs> So I have no explanation for your story. Well, thank you for giving me the platform and the, the opportunity to share the story again, Rich. I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you again for listening. And please leave any comments or suggestions. We're always looking for ways to improve our show and make it the best show it can possibly be. Visit mindfulaccord.com where you can find additional episodes and you can follow our blog. We give some helpful information on mindfulness, meditation, and just ways to manage our everyday stressful lives. And most importantly, if you know of a friend or a family member that would benefit from this story, please share it with them. Until next time, I'm Rich Decker.